The dedication is to the author's friends, Mac and Zoe, referring to them as her resets. The book contains eight chapters that provide techniques for resetting stress through lifestyle changes. The introduction tells the story of the author's friend, Liz, who was experiencing symptoms of chronic stress and burnout, like inability to unplug from work and feeling depleted, despite her usual active lifestyle. After speaking with the author, Liz was convinced she had stress and burnout. The author provided her with simple lifestyle changes to implement over three months to help reset her stress levels. The author is a Harvard-trained doctor who specializes in stress, burnout, mental health, and resilience. The book aims to provide sustainable and long-lasting changes to help readers reverse the biology of stress. It acknowledges stress is a normal human experience and debunks the idea that stress means weakness. The goal is to help readers manage and master their stress through the techniques in the book. So in summary, the dedication sets up the context of stress being addressed through lifestyle resets, using the author's friend Liz as an example case of implementing the techniques to overcome stress and burnout. The passage describes the author's experience with unhealthy stress and burnout as a young doctor in medical training. While working 80-hour weeks with little sleep or self-care, she had an alarming physical episode where she felt dizzy, out of breath, and had a pounding heart. As a trainee, she bought into the belief that pressure builds resilience. Pressure makes diamonds. She pushed herself relentlessly without questioning the unsustainable demands. However, her body was showing signs of stress through physical symptoms like palpitations at night. This personal story illustrates how high pressure, demanding work environments can lead to dysfunctional stress if proper self-care and balance are lacking. The author realized the resilience myth she adopted was not sustainable long-term. Her physical symptoms served as a wake-up call that changes were needed to better manage her stress levels. The author began experiencing heart palpitations every night as she tried to fall asleep. She was stressed from her medical training rotations, but didn't believe stress could physically affect her. Tests found nothing medically wrong with her heart. Her doctor attributed it to stress, but she didn't believe that. She tried relaxing more with no improvement. She randomly tried yoga and found it helped her sleep better. Continuing yoga, breathing exercises, walking more, and reducing caffeine helped resolve her palpitations over three months. This personal experience led her to research the mind-body connection and biology of stress. She discovered most doctor visits involve stress, but doctors rarely address it. The medical system is finally acknowledging the role of stress but still doesn't have time or tools to properly address it during visits due to other pressing health issues to monitor. The author aims to help fill this gap by educating patients on managing stress. The passage discusses the challenges doctors face in addressing stress with patients due to time constraints and stress manifesting differently for each person. Stress is often a diagnosis of exclusion where other potential causes must be ruled out first. Around 60 to 80% of doctors' visits ultimately determine stress is contributing to the patient's symptoms, even if it's not the sole cause. Stress can worsen many medical conditions. The story of Olivia, a mom stressed by raising teenagers, illustrates how a doctor determined her headaches were stress-related, but that diagnosis didn't help her manage the symptoms. The remainder of the passage critiques the concept of toxic resilience, where people ignore stress impacts to keep functioning through willpower alone. It promotes redefining one's relationship to stress through an exercise called the canary in the coal mine to identify one's biggest stress problem. In summary, it examines the challenges of addressing stress in healthcare but advocates recognizing how it manifests for individuals and redefining one's relationship to stress in a healthier, more sustainable way. The author uses the analogy of a tea kettle to describe how stress builds up in the body over time. As pressures and stresses increase externally, stress builds up internally like steam in a kettle. While the external stressors may be hard to change directly, the author argues we can control our internal experience of stress through various techniques. This prevents unhealthy stress levels from accumulating and boiling over. The techniques in the book teach ways to release therapeutic steam 
and reduce stress buildup in the body, even when external pressures remain. Turning down the burner by lowering physiological stress responses helps avoid feeling overwhelmed. Early in her career as a medical resident, the author felt intense stress. Her teacher pointed out that everyone feels intense pressure living their lives. This realization helped the author view patients' struggles with more empathy and understanding of the common human experience of stress. The quiz and stress score are meant to help the reader gauge their current stress levels and track changes over time as techniques from the book are applied. The goal is moving from unhealthy, imbalanced stress to more manageable, proportional stress. Stress can feel like a very isolating experience, even though it is something that impacts millions of people simultaneously. While everyone experiences stress intensely individually, it is actually a deeply unifying human phenomenon. Data shows that if you're in a room with 30 people, around 21 of them are likely feeling stressed or burned out. However, people typically feel alone in their stress and do not share about it due to stigma. Understanding how common stress is could help normalize the experience and reduce feelings of shame. Group therapy for stress could be beneficial by allowing people to connect over their shared experiences. Recent surveys show stress and mental health issues have increased greatly in recent years due to the pandemic, with nearly 70% of people feeling the most stressed in their careers. Burnout is now recognized as not just an occupational issue, but impacting parenting, caregiving, and other life domains. While stress often feels like an individual struggle, it is actually a fundamental part of human biology and psychology. The human brain has an innate stress response that can be triggered even when people are just trying to handle life's challenges. So in summary, while stress feels intensely personal, it is a profound unifying human experience impacting millions simultaneously. Greater social awareness of its prevalence could help reduce stigma and feelings of isolation. Stress causes the amygdala region of the brain to take over control from the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala activates the body's fight or flight stress response through the HPA axis. While acute stress is healthy and our brains are designed to handle it, chronic stress leaves the amygdala constantly activated. This can lead to burnout over time. The pandemic caused chronic stress for many as the threat persisted without a clear end. This exhausted people mentally and physically. Even after the acute crisis passes, people may experience a delayed stress response where emotions and stress symptoms surface later on as the body's defenses relax. This is a normal part of the body's stress response process. People who held it together well during the acute crisis period may feel more depressed, anxious, irritable, or unfocused later on once the threat is gone as their body processes the prolonged stress experience. This explains why some people feel worse now than during the height of the pandemic. So in summary, it explains the biological mechanisms of stress in the brain and body and how chronic stress from the pandemic can lead to delayed stress responses even after the crisis ends due to the exhaustion of prolonged activation of the body's stress systems. Raquel underwent treatment for cancer and suppressed her emotions during the process. Once her treatment was complete and she got the all clear, she experienced a delayed stress response where her true emotions emerged. This delayed stress response is normal and expected after an acutely stressful event like cancer treatment. The body goes into survival mode during the acute threat, but shows the stress response later once the threat has passed. Refugees often show resilient during escape and refugee camp living, but stress responses emerge later when finally in a safer place. This delayed response can happen after any acute stress or trauma. The pandemic acted as a chronic stressor for a prolonged period, unlike the acute stress situations the brain expected. This led to widespread burnout and mental health challenges emerging now. Understanding the delayed stress response allows people to normalize and validate shared experiences from the pandemic and past traumatic events. It creates an opportunity for healing and overcoming stress and burnout through lifestyle changes. The brain can be rewired for less stress through the principles of neuroplasticity and applying the resilience rule of two. Only making two lifestyle changes at a time 
to avoid overwhelming the system. The passage discusses a landmark 1967 study by Holmes and Rahe that found even positive life changes like marriage or job promotions can cause stress and impact health. It showed adapting to any change, even good ones, requires effort and can tax the brain and body. Doctors since have applied this stress of change concept when advising patients on sustainable lifestyle changes. They recommend starting with just two changes at a time to avoid overloading the brain with too much stress and new adaptation. This became known as the resilience rule of two. The passage then uses Adam as an example patient who wanted to tackle many changes at once. The doctor advised focusing on just sleep and exercise initially using specific reset techniques. When Adam followed up months later, they added two more changes gradually so his brain had time to adapt to each stressor. By introducing changes two at a time over time, his brain could cope with the stress even from positive changes, making all the difference in his ability to sustain improvements. This grounded approach follows how the brain and body naturally experience and process stress and change. The passage discusses moving from a stress mindset to a growth mindset. It talks about how the brain can change and adapt through techniques like the ones in this book. It introduces the concept of three zones, the fear zone when facing acute stress, the learning zone gradually adapting, and the growth zone gaining a new perspective. It uses the example of a patient who had a stroke to illustrate moving through these zones. The pandemic is used as a universal example of how people likely moved from an initial fear zone to a learning zone, by 2021-2022 as they adapted and are now in a post-pandemic growth zone where they can process what they experienced. It emphasizes that while the brain is skilled at managing stress, periods of recovery are needed to avoid one stress compounding another and leading to overload. The techniques in this book will help the reader move through the growth zone. It discusses avoiding negative self-talk when stressed and explains that stress is a very human experience, so there is nothing wrong with the reader for feeling it. The passage aims to help people adopt a growth mindset for dealing with stress. The passage discusses negative self-talk and how to turn it into something more positive and compassionate. It recommends asking oneself what matters most to me instead of what's the matter with me when ruminating on stress. Focusing on priorities can help make changes. The example of Wes is given, who felt stuck in unhealthy patterns due to stress from work and parenting. Working with a counselor, small changes like meal planning helped close the gap between knowing what to do and actually doing it. Discovering one's most goal, or what matters most short-term, helps make change feel possible by connecting it to priorities. Asking about one's endgame or vision of success helps reveal these most goals. Focusing on priorities through small achievable steps can help reduce stress over time. The passage discusses techniques for discovering what matters most to a person and setting meaningful goals to reduce stress and promote well-being. Technique number one is to uncover your most goal, a goal that is motivating, objective, small, and timely. It provides guidelines for crafting a goal that fits these criteria to help provide clarity and purpose. Technique number two is creating a backwards plan, writing out the steps needed to achieve your goal, working backwards from the end date. This creates a tangible step-by-step -step roadmap to help take action and overcome the difficulty of change. The example of Wes illustrates how applying these techniques helped him identify reducing stress through managing his diet as what mattered most. His backwards plan laid out incremental steps to pack meals ahead of time and lose weight over three months. Having clear goals and a plan empowers people to make positive changes that improve well-being and reduce stress over time, even if there are occasional setbacks along the way, as with Wes's experience. Discovering what truly matters provides motivation to keep working towards self-improvement. Here are the key points about happiness from the passage. Happiness has been one of the most popular search terms in the past few years, especially during the COVID lockdown, showing it is a universally desired goal. However, happiness is a vague and moving target. Research shows we aren't good at predicting what will truly make us happy. The passage uses Ryan, a music executive with anxiety, as an example. 
Though he had achieved career success and wealth, he was unhappy and anxious. Talking to Ryan, the author discovered his happiest memories were hiking with his grandfather as a child and playing guitar. The passage discusses two types of happiness, hedonic and eudonic. Hedonic is pleasure-focused happiness like luxuries, vacations, etc. But this type leads to a hedonic treadmill where the happiness doesn't last. Eudonic happiness comes from meaningful activities, relationships, accomplishments, things that use personal strengths and virtues. This type of happiness is more enduring. By refocusing on activities like hiking, nature, and guitar playing that were meaningful to him, Ryan was able to reduce his anxiety and find more lasting happiness and purpose. Happiness is complex and fleeting pleasures alone don't suffice. The passage discusses the difference between hedonic happiness, pleasure-seeking, and eudaimonic happiness, purpose, and meaning. Hedonic experiences like Netflix binges or spa days provide temporary joy and stress relief, but don't cure stress in the long run due to the hedonic treadmill effect. Eudaimonic experiences like community gardening or volunteering create lasting happiness by fulfilling our need for meaning and purpose. Studies show eudaimonic well-being has health benefits like lower inflammation. Everyone's conception of eudaimonic happiness is different and individual. It involves flow states and activities that use our strengths. A cancer patient found new purpose after retiring by rediscovering childhood hobbies like painting that brought her joy. Overall, the passage advocates for balancing hedonic and eudaimonic pursuits for long-term mental health and stress management. Carmen loved making clay sculptures a child and would play with them for hours on her front stoop. She thinks she bought her current house because the front stoop reminded her of those happy memories from her childhood. However, she never takes the time to sit on her stoop now and watch the world go by, even though she has nice wicker furniture there. During her session, the doctor suggests Carmen focus on two activities to cultivate eudaimonic happiness without external validation. The first is to pick up clay once a week and make a sculpture just for herself without judging. The second is to spend at least 30 minutes a couple times a week sitting on her stoop. When the doctor follows up with Carmen a month later, she has fully committed to these activities. She has created an artwork space at home and her sculptures have gotten more intricate. She also sits on her stoop almost daily. Carmen reports these activities have brought her great joy and that she feels more content and fulfilled than in a long time. Smartphones and other digital screens are one of the biggest contributors to stress and take up a lot of mental bandwidth. They are more detrimental than relationships with family and friends. Our brains have limited mental bandwidth and focusing on phones decreases our ability to focus, learn, make decisions, and stay on task. Even just having a phone nearby decreases brain power. While phones provide convenience, being constantly connected to them through checking emails, social media, etc. can worsen stress, anxiety, sleep issues, and more. The goal is not to give up phones entirely, but to create boundaries and be in control of our phones rather than letting phones control us. Designing digital boundaries can redirect attention to what matters most and reduce stress. Tracking phone usage can reveal just how often we mindlessly check phones. The chapter will provide techniques to find quiet from digital distractions and regain mental bandwidth and rest for better stress management. The passage describes a patient named Julian who came to a doctor complaining of unexplained fatigue. Julian consumed a huge amount of news and media throughout the day on his phone and TV. He would check headlines first thing in the morning and constantly throughout the day. The doctor noticed Julian's media consumption habits were interfering with his quality of life and possibly contributing to his fatigue, sleep issues, and irritability. The doctor diagnosed Julian with popcorn brain, a term for being overstimulated by constant online information. Popcorn brain can make it hard to disconnect from devices and live offline. To treat Julian, the doctor prescribed a media diet with time, location, and logistical limits on Julian's media use. This included only allowing 20 minutes of media twice a day and keeping his phone out of sight at other times. The goal was to help Julian break his habit of constant media consumption and regain focus on offline activities 
to improve his mental health and fatigue symptoms. The media diet approach has worked well for many of the doctor's other patients too. In summary, the passage describes how excessive media consumption can lead to a condition called popcorn brain and presents a media diet approach to addressing it as demonstrated through a case study of a patient named Julian. Julian was addicted to his phone and excessive media use. The goal was to set boundaries to break his habits and reduce stress. First, he was asked to use an alarm clock instead of his phone to avoid checking it first thing. His phone was moved across the room to create a physical boundary. During the day, his phone was kept out of reach to prevent automatic checking. He removed all notifications to make media use slightly inconvenient. After eight weeks, Julian saw improvements. He slept better and read books instead of mindlessly scrolling. He felt less stressed. Over time, he reduced daily phone time by 30 minutes, then to just 20 minutes twice a day. Julian found balancing media helped him relax and focus on other things. He felt in control again and like his old self. His stress levels continued improving with each visit. The key pieces were creating physical and logistical boundaries to disrupt automatic habits and reduce media overconsumption that was unhealthy and causing stress. Julian was able to regain balance and priority on other meaningful activities. Set timers and aim to be accountable for your time spent on digital devices. It's easy to lose track of time online. Opt out of push notifications and automatic pop-ups to control what grabs your attention. Keep devices at least 10 feet away while working and consider doing the same at home, especially around family. Don't keep your phone by your bed at night to prevent nighttime checks and interruptions to your sleep. When starting to cut back on screen time, anticipate strong urges to check your phone for no reason. Have alternatives handy, like doodling or a fidget toy to redirect attention. Rewiring your brain takes time. Congratulate yourself each day for minimizing distractions and making your own decisions about where attention goes instead of letting a device control it. Traumatic news coverage can trigger memories and stress reactions in people with past trauma histories. Limiting intake of upsetting content is important for mental well-being. Parental modeling of healthy screen habits is important for children. Adults also benefit from setting limits for themselves. Screen time before bed disrupts sleep quality and quantity. Improving sleep is key to managing stress. Make screens the last thing before sleep and the first after waking. Tanya, a graduate student, was extremely stressed with only six months left before graduation. She was overwhelmed with school, work, and studying. She was experiencing poor sleep, difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, and disrupted sleep. Her cortisol levels were high due to chronic stress. High cortisol can disrupt the sleep cycle and impact sleep quality. This leads to a sleep stress cycle where stress causes poor sleep, which adds to stress. Poor sleep takes a toll on physical and mental health. It slows cognition, weakens emotional regulation, and increases health risks like high blood pressure. It also increases risks of anxiety, depression, and mental health issues. Tanya's daily schedule left no time to unwind and release stress. She scrolled on her phone and watched TV late at night instead of relaxing. This activated her stress response right before bed. The doctor explained that managing stress is key to breaking the sleep stress cycle. Learning stress relief techniques through the rule of two approach could help Tanya reset her sleep and aid her graduation goals. The passage acknowledges that getting enough sleep is important for health and well-being, but also recognizes that occasional periods of poor sleep are normal and not necessarily harmful. Chronic long-term sleep deprivation is what can have negative effects. It advises focusing on self-care and self-compassion during times of stress-induced poor sleep, rather than berating oneself. Accept the sleep disruptions as an opportunity to be kind to oneself. On days with inadequate sleep, prioritize important tasks earlier in the day when energy levels are higher. Limit screen time and physical exertion to give the brain a break. Short naps are okay, but avoid long naps or caffeine late in the day. When facing stress and sleep disturbances, trust that the techniques discussed can help improve sleep over time with patience and practice. Allow grace during low energy periods rather than add more stress. The passage then discusses a case example of someone named Tanya, 
struggling with bedtime procrastination due to stress and anxiety. It provides suggestions for gradually shifting to an earlier bedtime to get back in sync with circadian rhythms. Tanya was struggling with late night screen time and not getting enough sleep. Her bedtime was around 1 a.m. The doctor focused on two interventions from the rule of two, minimize evening screen time and prioritize an earlier bedtime. Tanya agreed to minimize screen time by doing a relaxing yoga routine instead of screens for one hour before bed. She also moved the TV out of her bedroom. Her new goal was to be in bed by 10, 11 p.m., which research shows is optimal for heart health and sleep. The doctor helped Tanya slowly shift her bedtime back in 30-minute increments over three months to allow her body to adjust. By following good sleep hygiene like dim lights and a routine, Tanya was able to improve her sleep, lower her stress levels, and increase her GPA. She felt proud of making positive changes to her sleep. Here is a summary of the key points about improving sleep. The passage describes the story of Tanya, a student who was struggling with stress and lack of sleep. She followed two simple rules, going to bed 30 minutes earlier every two weeks and limiting screen time before bed. This helped her establish better sleep habits and improve her sleep quality. Getting good sleep is important for focus, mental health, physical health, and stress levels. Lack of sleep can biologically increase anxiety through its effects on the brain. The author recommends establishing a relaxing pre-bed routine without screens, setting a consistent bedtime, and aiming for seven to nine hours of sleep per night. This can help reduce stress and worry about sleep. It's normal for sleep to be disrupted sometimes, like during exam periods. The key is being able to get back on track with healthy sleep habits after occasional disrupted nights. Prioritizing sleep as a vital resource, just like Tanya did, can lead to significant improvements in well-being, stress, and achieving one's goals. So in summary, it emphasizes the importance of good sleep for health, describes simple strategies to improve sleep habits gradually, and encourages self-compassion when sleep is disrupted occasionally. Establishing a regular routine and minimizing stress about sleep are highlighted. The passage discusses the importance of social support and connection for managing stress and preventing burnout. Many patients report having little or no close friends they can lean on during difficult times, reflecting a loneliness epidemic. Lack of social support likely contributes to the high percentage of doctor visits related to stress. Social connection is critical for well-being. The quality of human relationships is the strongest predictor of lifelong happiness. Having social support is also beneficial for one's health. The author provides examples from his patient Selma, who focused solely on political activism with little time for leisure or enjoyment. The author encourages Selma to reconnect with her childhood love of soccer, to rebuild social connections and have fun. Selma joins a women's soccer league and finds community, exercise, stress relief, and enjoyment through this new social activity. It helps her manage stress and feel happier in her life. The passage emphasizes how taking time for leisure, enjoyment, and social connection is important for preventing burnout, even when one's work focuses on important causes. A balanced lifestyle with self-care is crucial for well-being. The passage discusses the mind-body connection and how we often fail to recognize the messages our bodies send us through stress and symptoms. The author shares her own experience as a medical resident, experiencing stress symptoms like heart palpitations, but pushing through without acknowledging the connection to stress. She later learned about the mind-body connection through research and a mindfulness class. This helped her understand how to use techniques to reset her stress response. The key technique discussed is Stop, Breathe, Be, which involves pausing a repetitive task, taking a deep breath, and being present. This takes just five seconds but can help regulate stress. The author found this technique extremely helpful in managing her stress as a medical resident and recommends it to patients. Breathing is uniquely under both voluntary and involuntary control linking it to emotions and stress response. In summary, the passage discusses how learning to recognize the mind-body connection through mindfulness techniques like conscious breathing can help manage stress and promote resilience. Here's a summary of the key points about unhealthy stress and breathing techniques 
to manage it, the breathing center of the brain called the home of the mind-body connection. Controlling your breath can activate this connection and reduce stress. Stop Breathe B technique is effective over time for stress reduction by activating the mind-body connection incrementally. Additional breathing techniques are needed for highly stressful moments. Diaphragmatic breathing, four to seven, eight breathing, and heart-centered breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing involves deep belly breathing to slow down a stressed fight or flight response. Four to seven, eight breathing has a four, seven, eight second pattern of inhaling, holding, and exhaling that activates the parasympathetic nervous system to reduce stress. Heart-centered breathing with a hand on the heart can provide self-soothing during sad or depleting emotions. These breathing techniques switch the nervous system from stress to calm states by controlling the breath and activating the mind-body connection. Regular practice can help manage stress in intense moments and in daily life. Miles, a software manager, had high blood pressure and prediabetes, according to his doctor. He was told to make lifestyle changes or start medication. Miles realized he needed to get healthier for himself and his family. Miles met with the author to address his stress levels. The author explained that moderate daily activity can help manage stress and make a meaningful impact on health. Even short walks or other small movements throughout the day are beneficial. Miles was skeptical that brief activities would make a difference. As he used to be an athlete, the author prescribed replacing one of Miles' daily 20-minute LinkedIn breaks with a 20-minute walk instead. This was a small, incremental change to start addressing Miles' stress and sedentary lifestyle in a sustainable way. The author explained that all or nothing thinking about exercise is a major barrier for many patients. Even small amounts of physical activity are better than nothing. Miles decided to try the prescription walk and see if it helped him start feeling better. Here's a summary of the key points about exercise and stress from the passage. Exercise helps reduce stress levels by lowering cortisol levels, which otherwise can lead to brain shrinkage and accelerated loss of brain tissue. Physical activity is a good way to reduce cortisol. Areas of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, are better able to handle stress and support memory and learning when a person exercises regularly. Exercise can help these areas grow thicker and more connected. Even short bursts of 10 minutes of mild exercise per day can provide brain benefits like improved mood and cognition. Very short, one to two minute spurts of activity multiple times per day are linked to lower risk of death from cancer and heart disease. Daily walking is prescribed to the individual as a way to familiarize the mind and body with physical responses to exertion, so stress responses don't seem as frightening. It also gets one out of their head and into their body. Focusing just on the walking itself without phones or devices helps make it a true movement meditation and establish the new habit more effectively. Distractions can undermine habit formation. So in summary, exercise is shown to help reduce stress and its negative effects on the brain through various physiological mechanisms, and even small amounts can provide benefits if done regularly. Here is a summary of the key points. Starting a daily walking habit requires overcoming physical and mental inertia. It's important to start small, such as a 20-minute walk daily, and build the habit gradually through repetition. Making the habit easy by reducing time, distance, and effort barriers helps it stick. For example, substituting a walk for an existing activity like online browsing, treating the walk like an automatic habit like brushing teeth, helps the brain form strong neural pathways through repetition. Doing it daily avoids decision fatigue. Enthusiasm for the new habit may wane after a few weeks as the brain acclimatizes. This is normal and doesn't mean the habit is no longer beneficial. It takes about two months on average for a habit to become fully automatic. Small celebrations of progress and remembering the mental benefits of walking can help maintain motivation during the learning and stability phases of habit formation. Consistency is key to long-term success. Miles began walking 20 to 30 minutes daily to build an exercise habit for his health. He tracked his progress and was surprised to have walked 28 of 30 days in the first month. On days where walking was difficult, he found ways to work it into his schedule, like walking meetings. 
tracking his progress daily gave him a sense of accomplishment and motivation to continue. Through his daily walks, Miles saw improvements in his stress levels, sleep, energy levels, and eventually added gym sessions. When he followed up with his doctor after four months, his blood pressure was normal and his prediabetes had improved. The passage discusses how even small amounts of daily movement through activities like walking can make a significant impact on health. It encourages finding ways to incorporate more movement into daily life, like parking farther away or taking stairs. It also discusses the gut-brain connection and how stress can impact digestion and cause symptoms like stomach pain, nausea, or changes to bathroom habits through the bi-directional communication between the gut and brain. Seeking medical advice is important if stress may be exacerbating any underlying digestive issues. Reina was struggling with stress management and visited the doctor seeking a concrete plan to help. She had been trying short-term stress relief tactics, but didn't address the underlying issues. The doctor emphasized the need to make sustainable lifestyle changes to prevent stress flare-ups rather than just reacting to acute episodes. Raina's stress would flare up before presentations, then subside without changes to her daily routine, which included late nights, irregular eating, and drinking half a bottle of wine daily to decompress. The doctor introduced a rule of two approach. Focus on two small changes at a time, like earlier bedtime and daily walks to slowly make lifestyle adjustments. Raina also agreed to try acupuncture and psychotherapy in addition to addressing possible alcohol dependence with her therapist. Within three months of following the treatment plan, Raina's gut-brain connection symptoms improved dramatically as she paid more attention to managing long-term stress through sustainable habits. The article describes a case of Lauren, a 49-year-old woman who was struggling with emotional eating and stress eating, consuming large amounts of chocolate cake every night. Her therapist suggested she try keeping a food log and starting a daily exercise routine, known as the rule of two. This helped Lauren gain awareness of her eating patterns and manage her underlying stress and anxiety. She enjoyed the walking time each day and found it meditative. Her stress level decreased and she lost about seven pounds over two months while eating less at night. When asked what else she could do, the therapist recommended the Mediterranean diet. This diet emphasizes fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds, fish, chicken, and some dairy. It's been shown to improve mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. It also benefits gut health and the microbiome. The key points are that managing stress through exercise and keeping a food log helped Lauren cope less with eating, and the Mediterranean diet was suggested as an overall healthy eating pattern for further stress reduction and well-being. Here is a summary of the key points. 32% of participants in a study experience reduced stress levels after following a Mediterranean diet, and those who most closely followed the diet saw even greater stress reduction of over 51%. Some simple ways to gradually adopt a Mediterranean diet include adding more fruits and vegetables, using olive oil for cooking, choosing fish, chicken over red meat, swapping white bread for whole grains, drinking water instead of soda, and incorporating probiotic foods like yogurt. Making gradual changes over time through the rule of two approach of only changing two things at a time every few weeks makes transitioning to the Mediterranean diet more manageable and less stressful. Shopping around the perimeter of the grocery store, which contains more fresh and minimally processed foods, makes it easier to incorporate Mediterranean diet foods with minimal effort. Learning to distinguish bodily signals of hunger from emotional eating cues can help reduce stress eating when not truly hungry. Keeping a food log can help with this. The case study of Lauren showed how implementing some Mediterranean diet principles, daily walking and food logging through a gradual rule of two approach helped her lose 11 pounds and gain confidence over three months despite facing challenges at home and work. Holly was feeling increasing burnout and stress from her high-paced work. She realized she needed to embrace a new approach. The counselor explained the concept of the stress response following a bell curve pattern. With too little or too much stress, productivity declines. But there is a sweet spot of moderate stress where performance is optimal. 
Taking regular short breaks can help reduce stress levels and move one toward the healthy middle range of the curve. The counselor drew on research showing breaks improve brain function and lower stress. Holly committed to honoring her breaks by stepping away from screens and doing gentle activity like walking or stretches. Over two months of consistent breaks, her stress levels decreased by 10 points based on a stress assessment. The Goldilocks principle suggests moderate, balanced stress is most productive. Taking breaks helps maintain this equilibrium and minimize burnout in high-demand jobs. Honoring breaks improves mindset and brain consolidation of new information. The passage discusses multitasking versus monotasking and their effects on productivity and cognitive function. It argues that multitasking, or frequently switching between tasks, is detrimental as it overloads the prefrontal cortex. It recommends using the Pomodoro technique of time blocking, where you focus on one task for 25 minutes, then take a five-minute break and repeat. This allows focused, uninterrupted time on each task without constant switching. The barista example suggests showing compassion to overworked service workers who may make mistakes due to their large mental load and constant multitasking. Time blocking is presented as an effective strategy to combat stress and burnout by giving the brain regular breaks from intense focus and allowing it to compartmentalize tasks. Regular short breaks are important for memory, attention, and problem-solving ability. With practice of monotasking using time blocks over several months, the person in the example was able to improve their focus, productivity, and recovery from burnout symptoms compared to their previous multitasking approach. Giselle worked as a medical writer from home while also caring for her toddler son. She found it difficult to be productive and meet deadlines due to constantly shifting between roles with no separation. The fake commute method was introduced as an intervention. It involved Giselle dressing for work and mentally preparing during a short walk, just as she would for a real commute. This helped her transition mentally from home responsibilities to work. Rituals like the fake commute help regulate emotions and mentally shift between roles by creating familiar patterns. They give a sense of control. The bookend method was also suggested using rituals not just in the morning, but also at the end of the workday to bookend roles and transition mentally from work to home life. Implementing these strategies helped Giselle compartmentalize her roles and improve her productivity, stress, and ability to meet deadlines while working from home as a parent. Rituals and mental preparation are important for balancing multiple roles with limited physical separation. Henry is a 24-year-old, package delivery driver who had to leave college to care for his ill mother and now supports his wife and five-year-old son. He is dissatisfied with his job and worries about the future. The author suggests the sticky feet technique to help Henry stay grounded and focused on the present moment. This involves imagining the feet as sticky and feeling connected to the ground to help stabilize the mind. Henry practices focusing on his physical surroundings like trees and houses, while delivering packages and uses deep breathing. This helps reduce his anxiety and worries about the future. By being more present, Henry starts interacting more with customers, which leads to a potential job opportunity with a sportswear company he delivers too often. He gets offered a better paying position there. Practicing being present through techniques like sticky feet can help solve worries by giving the brain a break from stressful rumination and future-focused anxiety. It also benefits relationships by leaving work at work. So in summary, the author describes how the sticky feet mindfulness technique helped package delivery driver Henry reduce stress and anxiety, leading him to be more present and social in his job, which then opened up a new career opportunity. Being mindful and grounded in the present moment can provide mental and even practical benefits. The inner critic is the negative voice in your head that puts you down and discourages you. It speaks louder during periods of unhealthy stress as a misguided way to protect you. Advice like just relax doesn't help when stressed as stress is a biological response that can't be talked away. Stress weakens self-efficacy, making the inner critic louder and adding to feelings of inadequacy. Practicing gratitude and expressing yourself can help break this cycle by silencing the inner critic and boosting self-efficacy. 
gratitude was shown to decrease stress and improve mood resilience. It can shift negative experiences from Velcro to Teflon in the brain through cognitive reframing. Taking a few seconds each day to focus on positives through gratitude can help build neural pathways that counteract stress over time. While not ignoring struggles, gratitude provides benefits even for those facing mental health issues. A daily gratitude practice can improve mental health over time, though the benefits may not be immediate. One study found larger differences in mental health for participants 12 weeks after starting daily gratitude writing activities. Gratitude may feel unnatural at first and require effort, especially for those experiencing chronic stress. However, with consistency over time, the brain can learn to adopt a language of gratitude, which helps silence the inner critic. Robin, an entrepreneur and new mom experiencing burnout, was reluctant to try gratitude writing, but agreed to do it as part of addressing her stress and burnout. She kept a nightly list of five things she was grateful for. After four weeks, Robin noticed her perspective shifting to be less critical of herself and calmer. Her inner critic was becoming quieter. She began relishing aspects of her life rather than just getting through each day. The story encourages keeping a gratitude journal daily before bed to help shift brain pathways away from stress over time through cognitive reframing. Expressive writing can also be therapeutic in releasing emotions. The passage discusses the benefits of expressive writing as a stress-relieving technique. The author explains how they personally benefited from expressive writing about a distressing past experience. Expressive writing involves writing continuously for 15 to 20 minutes per day for four consecutive days about a traumatic event. This helps process emotions and gain perspective. Two of the author's patients, Jeanette and Carmen, tried expressive writing. Jeanette wrote about her breakup and it helped her reduce anger and sadness. Carmen wrote about regretting a career decision and it validated her difficult experience. The author suggests living a lifetime in a day by incorporating elements of different life stages, childhood, work, vacation, community, solitude, retirement into each day. This can help redefine one's sense of time and provide satisfaction. Expressive writing and living meaningfully each day can help manage stress and cultivate resilience. The six elements of living a lifetime in a day focusing on gratitude, goals, experiences, relationships, contributions, and spirituality each day can help virtually anyone, regardless of their life circumstances. When suggested to terminally ill patients, it has given them vitality to feel strong and meaningful as they live out their remaining days. For chronically ill patients, it allows them to feel a sense of momentum and progress even during debilitating moments of illness. For healthy but stressed patients, it realigns their focus to more fully engage in their lives. Living a lifetime in each day through mindfulness and presence can help you stay focused on living fully, no matter what challenges you may be facing. It provides a broader lens on life and allows you to bring your best self forward each day through design. Visual reminders of goals, gratitude practices, and messages of self-love can reinforce living fully each day. The story is about a race between a hare and a tortoise, with a fox acting as the referee. The hare is much faster than the tortoise and easily runs ahead at the start of the race. However, the hare lays down for a nap, confident it can rest until the slow tortoise catches up. While the hare sleeps, the tortoise keeps walking slowly but steadily. It eventually passes the sleeping hare and continues on towards the finish line. When the hare wakes up, it runs as fast as it can but cannot pass the tortoise in time. The tortoise wins the race despite being much slower because it kept going at a steady pace while the hare rested. The moral is that the race is not always won by the swiftest. Steady and determined effort can overcome moments of inaction or overconfidence, even against a faster opponent. Focus and perseverance are important for success. Here is a summary of the key points about stress from the outside sources provided. Stress and anxiety have reached alarming levels for many due to the COVID-19 pandemic, economic pressures like inflation and geopolitical conflicts. Mental health issues are now the top health concern for Americans. Long-term stress takes a physical and emotional toll. It has been linked to increased risk of heart disease, depression, and other illnesses. 
stress levels remained high even after the early phases of the pandemic. Workplace stress is a major issue, with many feeling overworked and burned out. Flexible work policies have not alleviated work-related stress for many. Managing workloads and setting boundaries is challenging. Healthcare providers themselves experience high levels of stress and burnout due to workload, administrative burdens, and compassion fatigue. This impacts their ability to treat patients effectively. The COVID-19 pandemic significantly worsened anxiety and depression rates. Many have unmet mental health care needs due to shortages in providers and resources. Telehealth helped but does not replace in-person care. Parents have shouldered additional responsibilities during the pandemic, and many are suffering from severe parental burnout as a result of trying to work and care for children simultaneously. This takes a toll on families. Long-term stress takes both a physical and mental toll. It is linked to increased risk of major illnesses like heart disease and depression if not managed appropriately. Finding healthy ways to manage and reduce stress levels is critical. Here is a summary of the key points from the provided articles. One, the first article discusses the psychology of the refugee experience based on Ukraine. It notes that fleeing war and resettling is psychologically taxing and can cause stress, anxiety, grief, and loss. Support systems are important to help refugees process trauma and rebuild stability. Two, the second article discusses a Yale study that found the hippocampus region of the brain is linked to feeling stress. Activity in hippocampus connections predicts stress levels. Three, the third article compares meditation and medication for treating stress and mental health issues. It notes meditation has mental and physical benefits with few side effects compared to medications. And four, the fourth article introduces the Holmes Raha Stress Inventory, a tool used to measure stress based on life events. It rates events on a scale from low to high impact on perceived stress. Five, the fifth article provides context on the widespread use of the Holmes Rahe Stress Inventory in occupational health research to understand workplace stressors. Six, the sixth article argues that small daily habits have a bigger impact on happiness than occasional big experiences. It's important to focus on regular small positive behaviors. Here are the key points from the summaries. Studies found associations between poor sleep characteristics like short sleep duration and cardiometabolic health issues in adolescents. Short and long sleep duration at ages 50, 60, and 70 were also associated with increased risk of multimorbidity. Self-reported sleep patterns showed links between short sleep and high blood pressure. Insomnia was also identified as a risk factor for depression in a meta-analysis. Optimal nap duration is considered 10 to 30 minutes. Longer naps can cause grogginess. A study found that bedtime procrastination mediated the relationship between anxiety and sleep problems. Anxiety may increase procrastination of going to bed. Getting enough and consistent sleep was linked to better heart health in a large study. Later sleep onset timing was associated with increased cardiovascular disease risk. Anxiety and sleep deprivation activate similar brain regions. Sleep loss can amplify anxiety responses in the brain. Poor sleep may cause or exacerbate anxiety. Adequate sleep can help rewire anxious brain patterns. Pregnancy and having children impacted both quality and duration of parents' sleep, especially for mothers. Factors like increased smartphone use, social media, and technology may contribute to loneliness, poorer quality social interactions, and lower well-being. Rates of loneliness and isolation have increased. Social isolation is a risk factor for mortality and health issues like inflammation. Supportive social relationships and giving support to others was linked to lower interleukin-6 levels. Sedentary behaviors like sitting have increased markedly. High sitting time is linked to various health risks like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, anxiety, and mortality. Here's a summary of the key points from the sources. Several studies found increases in feelings of depression and anxiety during the COVID-19 pandemic, likely due to reduced physical activity and increased sedentary behavior from lockdowns and social distancing. Sitting for long periods is linked to higher depression and anxiety. Many Americans want to exercise, but say they lack time. Physical activity can help manage health conditions like high blood pressure, 
high cholesterol, and diabetes by improving outcomes. Exercise may be more effective than weight loss alone for reducing health risks of obesity. Exercise is an effective way to relax and reduce stress levels. It impacts the brain in ways that can positively influence mood. Physical activity is associated with reductions in cortisol levels, improvements in brain structure and function, and reduced anxiety through impacts on brain connectivity and plasticity. Exercise increases size of hippocampus and can help prevent cognitive decline and dementia. Even mild or brief exercise can stimulate brain regions. Regular physical activity is linked to lower risk of mortality and can benefit overall health and well-being. Activities like walking, golf courses provide exercise benefits. Habit formation takes time, but making exercise easy and accessible helps build new habits. The gut microbiome influences mental health through impacts on neurotransmitters and communication between gut and brain. Diet, stress, and lifestyle like exercise can shape the microbiome. The gut contains neurons and is sometimes called the second brain as it communicates bidirectional signals to the brain that impact mood, cognition, and behavior. Imbalances in the gut microbiome are implicated in various disorders and self-medicating with substances like alcohol that can further disrupt the microbiome. Nutritional psychiatry explores links between diet, brain health, and mental well-being through impacts on the microbiome. Certain foods may help support mental health. Exercise is also suggested to curb junk food cravings. Here is a summary of the key points from the articles. Exercise can help attenuate unhealthy food cravings and consumption in response to stress. A study found that acute exercise reduced snack intake of unhealthy foods after a stressful task compared to a non-exercise control group. Another study found that an acute bout of moderate intensity exercise led to improved dietary self-control on a subsequent unrelated task, indicating exercise may enhance cognitive control related to food decisions. A weight loss trial found that greater exercise adherence and less decline in physical activity during the trial predicted better weight loss outcomes. The Mediterranean diet is associated with health benefits like reduced risk of heart disease, diabetes, depression, and cognitive decline. Components like omega-3 fatty acids, antioxidants, and fiber are thought to contribute to these benefits. Randomized controlled trials found improved symptoms of depression from following a Mediterranean diet or dietary improvement program focusing on whole foods. A Mediterranean diet intervention in older adults altered the gut microbiome and reduced frailty and improved health status. Certain gut bacteria are associated with brain health and metabolism. Prebiotics and fermented foods can beneficially shift the gut microbiome composition and may impact stress levels and perceived stress. Consuming a whole food diet higher in vegetables and lower in sodium was associated with reductions in stress levels over an eight, eight week period according to one study. A psychobiotic diet focused on prebiotic and probiotic foods was found to positively impact microbial stability and perceived stress in a healthy adult population in another study. Here's a summary of the key points from the article, Changes You and Your Brain, Greater Good Magazine, June 6, 2017, slash greatergood.berkeley.edu, slash article, slash item, slash how gratitude core changes you and your brain. Gratitude practices like writing gratitude letters have been shown to have mental and physical health benefits, like reducing stress, depression, and improving well-being. On a neurological level, Gratitude activates the prefrontal cortex, which regulates emotions and promotes social behavior. It also deactivates the amygdala, which is involved in fear, anxiety, and stress. More longitudinal studies are needed, but research suggests gratitude may help the brain process social information differently by facilitating making personal connections and interpreting ambiguous social cues in a more positive light. Expressive writing helps process emotions and makes them less bothersome over time by facilitating exposure and habituation to stressful experiences. Gratitude writing may provide similar benefits. Keeping a gratitude journal has been shown in randomized controlled trials to improve mental health and sleep quality for psychotherapy clients. Expressing gratitude may improve resilience and outlook. The article provides an overview of research on how gratitude practices like writing letters of gratitude 
can change neural patterns in the brain to help manage stress, anxiety, and improve well-being and social processing. It discusses neurological mechanisms like activating the prefrontal cortex and deactivating the amygdala. Here is a summary of the key points. Cortisol is a stress hormone released by the body in response to stressful situations. High levels over a prolonged period can be harmful. Exercise helps reduce cortisol levels. Cortisol plays a role in the mind-body connection. The delayed stress response causes cortisol levels to remain elevated after a stressor is removed. This can disrupt sleep. The gut-brain axis refers to communication between the gut and brain via hormones, neurotransmitters, and the nervous system. What we eat can impact mood, stress levels, and mental health through this connection. The COVID-19 pandemic caused increased stress, anxiety, and disrupted sleep patterns for many people initially. It highlighted the need for self-care and stress management. Chronic sleep deprivation has many negative physical and mental health consequences, like increased stress levels, mood issues, and reduced mental performance. It is linked to higher risk of chronic disease over time. Screen time before bed can disrupt sleep. Here is a summary of the key points about smartphones, screen time, and stress from the passage. Smartphone overuse can damage brain function and compromise attention by consuming cognitive resources. It can disrupt sleep and increase stress levels. Excessive screen time is linked to mood changes, loneliness, and increased mental health issues like anxiety, according to research. Physical issues like disrupted sleep and waking up at night are also connected to smartphone use. Changing bedtime habits, like limiting smartphone use before bed, can help improve sleep quality and quantity. Setting boundaries around screen time is important for well-being. Strategies proposed in the text to reduce smartphone stress include limiting use to certain times of day, exercising without devices, and being more present during in-person interactions. Taking breaks from screens is recommended. Issues like smartphone attachment, using phones as a coping mechanism, comparing oneself to others online, and trauma from cyberbullying or negative content can all increase stress from excessive smartphone and screen time. Managing use is key.